Hello, good morning, good evening, and welcome again to all of you. This is the second of the three expert talks in the context of Emerging International Voices, a program that the Goethe Institute is conducting together with IFLA. My name is Brigitte Dölgast. Uh, I am the head of the library department at the Goethe Institute in Munich. The Goethe Institute, as you may know, is the cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany with a global reach. We promote knowledge of the German language abroad and foster international cultural cooperation. We have 157 institutes in 97 countries and 96 of the institutes also have a library. We started our series last week with the topic digitalized libraries, why, what, and how. Participants explored the different ways in which digital tools can enhance the existing library services, as well as making it possible to offer new ones. The focus was put on the process of creating digital libraries. How can we make sure that we create platforms that suit the user's needs? We continue this week by focusing on the question from a physical to a virtual community space, what is possible? I'm really looking forward to the input and the discussion and therefore hand over immediately to Gerald Leitner, Secretary General of, Secretary General of IFLA, who will act as moderator for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Brigitte, for your warm welcome and for your ongoing partnership with IFLA. As always, it's a great pleasure to be working with you, with the Goethe Institute, and especially with you in Kosha to identify and support the thought leaders of the future and to drive forward the discussion today. I don't want to repeat my words uh, from last week on the importance of being ready to share, to exchange, on the need always to question our assumptions in the light of experience, on the duty to remind ourselves and to accept no one has a monopoly on good ideas because none of this has changed and our great discussion showed the value of these opportunities. Perhaps the one thing that has changed has been that it has become much clearer, at least in Europe, that, they are, that we are a long way from the end of the pandemic. Just this week we have seen new restrictions imposed. For example, yesterday I, I drove from uh, from Vienna to Amsterdam, and now I have to be in 10 days in quarantines. And here in the Netherlands, all restaurants are closing, masks are being recommended or even made obligatory. And I think the same, it's in many other countries. For the moment, fortunately, libraries are remaining open, but events having been canceled and new rules on pre-booking visits introduced. The skills for working from home that we gained in the first months of the pandemic being necessary again. As possibilities for in-person events diminish, the need to use digital tools will grow again, not just for lending, for, consultant, for consultations for other services, but also for those wider activities that libraries undertake in order to support their communities. Of course, it's not as if the use of digital ever went away. Statistics from England, for example, suggest that even with institutions open again, numbers of visitors are much lower than at the same time last year. Meanwhile, users have continued to draw on digital collections, join digital story times and events. These ways of giving access to library services, at least for those fortunate enough to be connected, are likely to be with us for some more time. Either as the only means of supporting communities or as more important part than before of a hybrid model. This in turn raises important questions about how effective digital tools are, in particular when it comes to more complex services such as community building. For all of the new possibilities, they are open up is this in addition to or in place of the successful approach of the past? This is at the heart of the discussion today. To tackle the questions, I'm very happy that we are joined by two excellent speakers. 
Lux Warthout and Katrin Schuster, who I will introduce shortly. I should also remind you to post your questions via the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Please do use the opportunity to vote for questions you find more interesting as this will help us prioritize these. But first of all, though, I would like to hand over to Stephen Weiber, our manager for advocacy and policy at Eifler, who will give, who will get us going on with a short poll. Stephen, please continue. Thank you very much, Gerald, for the introduction, and thank you very much to everyone who's joined us today. So. Just like last week, we want to start the conversation by building a little bit of an idea about where you stand, what your, what your feelings are about digital community building through libraries. So you should see up on your screen now a poll. And the question is, on a scale of one to 10, where one is not at all and 10 is certainly, do you think that libraries can create as strong a link with their communities in a virtual as in a physical world? So the votes are starting to come in, 20 in already. Sixty in, they're all good. There's really good quick voting here. Let's give another 10 seconds. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, we've got over 100 people have voted, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And what you should see now is that we have, again, we've got a, a people are relatively optimistic. This is a positive. The answers are quite well split, but the biggest two scores are for seven and eight out of 10. So I think that people are pretty confident about where we are. Now, what we'll be doing is asking the same question at the end of this and we'll see if those answers have changed. So um, with that, I'm going to hand back to Gerald. So thank you, Stephen. Uh, it's great to see uh, that you are really all uh, used to use already all the tools, uh, such a fast answer to all of it. Uh, I want then to turn to our first speaker, Luke Swartaus, Director of Digital Policy at New York Public Library. Luke has held this role since 2017, but has worked at the library since 2013, previously leading the institution's work on adult education, where he focused on language and literacy instructions, technology, training, job information, and adult programming, and oversaw New York Public Library's Library Hotspot Project. He also brought previous experience in education, previously serving as senior advisor to the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor and Pensions in Washington, D.C., and, and as higher education specialist for the Public Interest Research Group. As head of digital, look, I'm sure you are one of the most busiest people in the library right now, and so I am happy that you have freed yourself uh, especially so early in the morning for us. Many thanks, Luke, and the floor is yours. I think you are muted, Luke. It's a bad sign for a digital presentation when you oh, start morning. off muting it's yourself. Morning. It's morning for you. <laughs> it's true. I should say, um, so thank you, Gerard, uh, Stephen, and all for, for assembling. Um, I have a three-week-old son who at some point might be handed to me. So with, it's seven o'clock in the morning here. Um, with that, apologies. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, share my screen. Um, I have a, uh, I have a uh, short presentation. Is that coming through? Yes, that works. Um, great. Uh, so Gerard did my introductions. I work for the digital team of the New York Public Library. Uh, New York Public is uh, sort of has research centers and public libraries serving about 4 million New Yorkers. And our digital team is about 30 engineers, technologists, um, product managers who help manage a set of digital tools we use for our patrons on both sides of the house. 
I'm not a technologist, I'm not a lawyer. Um, uh, I worry about how the technology is changing what we are as a business and particularly the, the digital transformation of the, of the library. Um, I loved in the introduction that uh, to celebrate every voice and respect every voice, I, I offer this just as a sort of participant here uh, and uh, wanted to answer this question by sharing a little bit about some of what we look at at New York Public when we try and answer this sort of question about communities. Um, the question about what's possible, I think starts with what do you think the library's value is? Um, in the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna give a book recommendation, offer a provocation, and then a case study uh, to try and answer, come at this question a bit from the side. So the book recommendation is called The Business of Platforms. And forgive me if this is known by everybody, but I recommend it. It came out last year and it talks about uh, the major digital platforms and how they approach their strategy. Uh, it's worth reading and I'm gonna you do a bad job summarizing it, but basically here are three main takeaways. Digital platforms are powerful. They stand between business and the public and in doing so can rewrite the rules. So booking sites get to redesign um, the rules under which people think about hotels for uh, hundreds of years, you know, for a hundred years, it was the star system. Digital platforms offer transparency uh, around pricing and all of a sudden the hotels find themselves uh, on the back foot having to redesign their, their, their sort of business. They say there are three types of digital platforms. So there are transactional platforms. So that would be like that hotel booking example or um, Rakuten or, uh, 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 or Amazon sales where uh, shops come and customers come and they buy things. Uh, there are innovation platforms. So that would be Apple's iOS or Google's Android systems that create a set of conditions on which people can build other businesses. Uh, the advantage of that is Apple has lots of apps in its app store that it didn't build. Um, uh, and it takes 35% of all of the sales as a, uh, in return for having created a sort of communities. And then there are a set of companies that are in between. When you confront one of these situations, and this is the place that we find ourselves in, in, in the online community space as libraries, the authors say you have one of three choices. You can build a competitive, uh, a competitor. You can buy uh, an existing platform or you can join a, a platform. And given uh, the relative resources of the library compared to the platform world, we often find ourselves in a join, join um, decision, which uh, I think is the one we will face in the coming months if we think about what tools to use to, to help people online. But I do wanna, before I get back to the online, I wanna um, think for a moment about the physical library itself, because I think there is buried in this book an explanation of the power of the public library. And it's as a platform in the sort of transactional platform definition. So uh, we enable community uplift, not by writing the books or publishing the books or coming up with all of the information, but we stand between patrons and publishers or speakers or government or vendors. And that has allowed us over time to buy different books or different materials, to add different services, to add educational offerings, to add offerings for children, to add um, uh, all the while people continue to come to us as, a, as a, uh, a place where they count on a range of services and a range of information and a range of knowledge and a range of reading. And this is, I think, a different approach than I might have had several years ago in, in understanding the value of the library. But it's relevant because um, all of that changes online. So this is a, an old cartoon from a, a magazine called The New Yorker, published in our city. Some people may be familiar with, it's from 1993. It's, you know, um, you know, online, no one knows that we are uh, an essential, democratic institution to support communities. And the if, if the value we have is as the platform in the physical world, then that question of how do we move online and what, how do we support community online is a different one than if you think that the thing we do is um, offer story times or 
uh, or any of the individual activities or offer books and all of those things. And that uh, candidly makes us uh, on our digital team somewhat more trepidatious, uh, concerned about the sort of challenges we face. So the last thing is I wanna offer a case study. So about 10 years, US public libraries started offering eBooks. Uh, the Kindle had come out from Amazon and our patrons wanted to read eBooks. And we made a decision at the New York Public Library to join, uh, to, to use a vendor called Overdrive, which others may be familiar with, which is essentially we made a join decision. And that was the easiest way and maybe the only way for us to be able to offer eBooks to our patrons. Now, 10 years on, the question for us is, is that Overdrive application that patrons use to read books more like a book or is it more like the library? And it's possible that it's actually not like the book, it's more like the library. Because now about half of our adult, before the closure from COVID, about half of our books were read, half of our adult print books were read through Overdrive's, uh, through an ebook application. And the reason I think it might be more like the library is those were people who, who almost never passed through anything that was in control of the library. They read books totally unguided by the expertise of library. You know, there were no librarians, almost no librarians involved in any of the decisions that led them to, to, um, to select those books or, or read those books. And I actually think those ebook platforms are, are, are essentially uh, uh, another branch of our libraries only a branch that is entirely out of our control. And again, I, I, I'm looking at this because we're sort of 10 years into the digital transformation around eBooks and we're just starting uh, on the community one. And, and I'm, you know, I wonder, I wonder, you know, when we put something on YouTube, are we still being the library in the same way? Or are we joining YouTube's platform in a way that um, lets people, encourages people to turn to YouTube as the place where they uh, come to get trusted information. And we are just a content creator like millions and millions of other institutions. Which is why I sort of end with these sort of, you know, what can we do? I think we have to be really clear about how we deliver value to our community. So not just, um, not just general, but, but really specific, and then really clear about our values uh, so that we can interrogate the technology choices and make our build by join choices carefully. Um, you know, I, I wish I could say, you know, let's use this platform or this is the program that's sort of more, but I think we're at a really crucial moment as, as all the sort of introductory speakers have, have said. And, um, and I, I think it will require us to, to think clearly about what we want to accomplish and, um, and choose carefully. Because the risk is that we fracture ourselves across a bunch of different platforms in a way that uh, uh, does not replicate the central role that we've had in communities. And that central role is the thing that has allowed us to evolve and change and be successful over time. So with that, I uh, want to thank everybody and uh, look forward to the chat. Thank you, Luke, for this. Uh, was a great speech and I'm sure there will be some great questions for you coming up afterwards. But now I would like to turn to Katrin Schuster from Munich Public Libraries in Germany. Katrin has been at the library for five years now, working on digital communication until April when she took on the role of head of direction. Uh, her background is as a freelance journalist working for papers including uh, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, as well as working as an editor at the Bavarian Literature Portal. I'm looking forward then to hear your perspective, Katrin, from Munich of digital community building. Thank you, Katrin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I was thrown out so my video isn't working. Maybe the host can start the video again. I'm sorry. Connection was gone. <laughs> you should be able to use your video now, Catherine. Thank you. So 
So I share my screen. So thank you for being here today with you. It's, thank you, Ifla and Goethe Institute for, for inventing and organizing this really inspiring group of the emerging internet international voices. I've read all of your articles and I'd be happy to discuss with you afterwards. So first thing I brought with me today are some facts and figures about Munich Public Library in the state it is in. Because I think everybody knows New York Public Library, but perhaps not Munich Public Library. Munich has almost 1.5 million inhabitants and the urban society is diverse and vivid and a bit under pressure because uh, Munich is one of the most expensive cities in Germany. Munich is growing and is growing fast and so does the Munich Public Library at the moment. Um, sometimes it feels a bit like working at a construction company. So next year we'll have to split and move our central library into three different locations. Uh, within the next years we will be opening three new branches and at least two libraries to have undergone a renovation will be reopening. So changes in the air everywhere. And as Gerald said, for the past five years, I was responsible for digital customer communications at the Munich Public Library. And when I started this job um, in 2015, the MPL had one website, last relaunch in 2012, and one Facebook fan page. And as I think digital communication is all about participation. One of the first things I did was to, to open the doors to virtual spaces for the employees. I offered a bunch of possibilities, approaches, accesses from photo sessions to, for viral campaigns, to recommendation to, for our reading challenge. Every branch got its own Facebook fan page. And since 2016, our Instagram channel, because Instagram is the first uh, social media network which took the slogan mobile first for serious. So our Instagram uh, is on a journey across the institution and is handed over uh, to another colleague or team every four weeks, presenting a new internal perspective on the MPL and offering another look behind the scenes every four weeks. What I want to say is you are not able to, to design or create virtual communities if your workforce doesn't know how to act and, and communicate in virtual spaces. You have to get a digital corporate culture first. And, and the funniest and most sustainable way to get one is a good old learning by doing, and that's what we did. Today, there are over 20 Facebook fan pages. Each branch operates its own, as I said. There's a lively corporate blog. One, no, no, since today, two Twitter accounts and two Instagram channels. There are over a dozen professional newsletters. There's a Pinterest page, um, half dead, half alive, I admit. And there's a YouTube channel, which is because of the situation getting better and better day by day. And since January 2020, there's a new website. And that's the one thing I want to show you today. Uh, we started our discussions about the new website in autumn 2018 and until autumn 2019 we organized five or six workshops where we, where we discussed different aspects of virtual communities with our internal stakeholders. Um, main slogan or, or the basis for everything that followed was the sentence das ist mein Ort which frames our vision statement. Das ist mein Ort means this is my place, but art is not only place, it's also, it also refers to, to, to space, to location, even position. So our mission was to, to design a virtual space as a my place for our users, where they can experience the same feelings of belonging, freedom, and likewise serendipity and participation as in the real library. Um, the website went online the 9th of January 2020 and we took it as a starting point for our journey with the help of, of surveys and data we wanted to explore the needs and the interest and the talents and the topics of our communities as well as the opportunities to reach new audiences. I want to draw your attention on 
three main elements of this site, our menu, our stage and our search. Uh, search was uh, clearly the first thing we talked about because it's definitely one of the most important reasons why people are coming into a library. They want to find them, something, be it a certain book, you know, the one with the blue cover, sometimes love of the lives, be the movie for the evening, or the answer to a pressing question. And that's why our search is located in the center, as you can see here, because ironically, a search usually is the thing most people are searching for on a website. So we put it in the center that nobody could or would miss it. And it is really trying hard to do its best to help all users by answering their questions. It scans our catalog, it scans our events, our blog and all the content on the website. The big picture is called the stage, and that's literally what it is. It's a space for a grand entrance for our, of our community, a place where we are highlighting contributions of our users, our patrons, be it craft work, as you can see here, or a photo challenge, or be the video off, or a podcast about a community event. Our menu, third way to enter the virtual library. As you can see on the, we, on this, on this level, we don't talk about branches or opening hours or books. Instead, we ask visitors just one question, what do you want to do? And informieren, entdecken, mitmachen means inform, discover, participate. Three main actions of our patrons. And when you click on these words, you'll find information about our branches, opening hours, there they are, our catalog, library buses, and so on. Section discover, there we trying to group events, articles of our blog, our services and our holdings under certain topics, as you can see, literature, fields and family, knowledge and education. Participate in turn lists all the ways to participate at the library. So if you come around, get a library card, join the discussion on social media, apply for a job at the MPL. Missing in this list is Via Bibliotheken. That was our attempt to, to build a virtual library community or ambassador program. Um, Via Bibliotheken is not so easy to translate. Via stands for we, and Bibliotheken is the German word for library. So, um, at the same time, bibliotheken sounds a bit like a verb, so it means something like we are librarian, if it's possible. Um, we are bibliotheken began as a newsletter community. Uh, our aim was to inspire interactions between physical and virtual spaces by connecting communities of practice. But to make it short and painless, as Germans say, we bibliotheken died in March 2020 because of lack of resources, clearly a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. I don't know yet if we bibliotheken will ever be resurrected, at least the hashtag we bibliotheken is still alive on Twitter and Instagram. Like everybody else in this room, I think COVID-19 hit us hard and unexpected. Our library is closed 13th of March, Friday 13th, and began to re reopen on the 11th of May. Closing was surprisingly easy. Reopening therefore is a long and exhausting process that has not yet come to an end. And as many libraries during lockdown, we, we really blossomed into an inventor's office. Events department created virtual discussions and reading hours. Social media team designed schedules for book talks, challenges, and edutainment on Facebook and Instagram. We offered the three million people in Munich and the surrounding areas a three months free subscription to our digital holdings. And day by day, we got really more and more thrilled about the opportunities and the flexibility of our newborn website. New landing pages went online nearly every day. Information about COVID-19, about digital literacy, about homeschooling and updating was easier than ever. What a luck in these times. But actually, that was not the trip we expected to go on with our website. So since March, 
new questions about our virtual communities arose and we haven't yet answered the old ones. Um, therefore, I list a few of our buzzwords and the questions they pose to a public library. First one is data and democracy. So libraries are kingdoms of data and genuine democratic institutions, but how do we combine our requirements for privacy and openness in virtual communities? Can we measure our democratic impact? And if politics go more and more virtual, what about the people who have no access to the internet or does social media endanger democracy? The second one is on audience and accessibility. During lockdown, as anybody else, we lost existing audiences and gained new ones. What do the new virtual audiences need and where do the old ones get their digital literacy from? How do, we, how do we ensure that everybody gets and keeps access to our virtual spaces? Third one is co-presence and coincidence. One of the most popular asset, assets of physical library space, as you know, so space where stays free and nobody needs to explain why he or she is here or what he or she is doing here. Thinking of libraries, the idea of co-presence is, is the one thing I like the most. Many different people with different interests and burdens together in one room, but mostly for their own, being here privately, but seeing a lot of other people and being seen by them. So this social serendipity leads to coincidences between people and people, between people and books, between people and space. And my question is, is it possible to transfer this idea of co-presence and coincidence into the virtual world? Second one, sense and sensibility. A fourth one, sorry. Because of COVID-19, we, we, we all experienced a, a really devastating loss of senses, as I think. You're not allowed to approach people, touching is forbidden. Much of our days is physical distancing. If, you, if you're wearing a mask, you, you don't smell the world anymore and understanding speech is sometimes difficult. And when you get COVID-19, you even lose the taste of things. So I see there a remarkable commonality with the virtual world. It doesn't smell or taste either. You can touch it and connecting by words can be a challenge too. So I have many questions about this. So is the lack of sensuality in virtual communities a limitation or a chance? What is the difference between a 3D and a 2D community? Or can we can we digitize sensibility in some way? Or should we should we easily get rid of these real life things and finally start thinking about something that, that really something new that really deserves the name virtual community, as Luke said. You don't know if you're a dog or a person. So finally to answer this big question of our today's discussion, what is possible? I really don't know, but I'm, but I'm excited to find out with you today. Perhaps we have some ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrin, for this. And thank you, Luke, for your great presentations. Um, so, yeah, we've still got plenty of time for the questions, which is really good because we also have plenty of them. And for the first question, um, this has been answered um, in the Q&A section already by Luke, but I think it's a very, very interesting one. And so if Lisa, if you could maybe, if you'd like maybe to ask the question yourself and we could maybe talk about it a bit more. Hi, um, I'm not sure you can see me. We can, no. but it's all right, we can hear you. Okay, we were wondering if you have some more best practice examples about using digital platforms, because I thought it was really interesting how you said that um, when you post a video on YouTube, you have to think about, are you a content creator? Or are you a library? So, yeah, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Thank you. Um, certainly. So I put these in the chat because it's a, it's a great question. And I, so here are some things we talk about internally. Uh, before we ever get to the technology, 
define our intended objectives, um, set uh, targets and goals, and be rigorous about sort of about reviewing them. That's not to say, in, in fact, often it's not that we're trying to find. Um, you know, there's a lure in going online of, uh, you know, we used to serve 10 people in the branch and now we can serve a million people. And um, that's kind of a, a very uh, um, attractive sort of idea because we all want to have the sort of biggest impact we can. Um, but it can be fine if you only want to serve those same 10 people online, just be sort of sincere about it. And then to the question about YouTube, you know, we don't want to create a uh, conditions on people using our products or our services other than the library card. So if we uh, do put something on Facebook, uh, we want to make sure it's also on our website so that we don't make basically Facebook uh, a sort of de facto library card. And then the last bit is, uh, this is also sort of asked otherwise in the questions. We know the tendency of digital technology to exacerbate inequality. And so often when we design digital services, we have to think about how we also design parallel physical services uh, for populations that are not online or, um, uh, or would sort of prefer to access in, in other places. So these are not specific answers on technology, but a, a little bit about our thought process when we evaluate uh, uh, these types of questions. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah. Catherine, we just ask if you want to add anything on that in English, preferably. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to discuss what Luke mentioned, but it's another thing about the, the, the platforms which are not your own, because that's one thing I'm thinking about all the day, all the, very often, because I learned that you must rely on Facebook, Twitter, and so on. So we are same trying to concentrate on our own platforms, but it's difficult with Overdrive and German things online. Uh, the library, uh, isn't isn't seen anymore so it's overdrive it's not the library and it's really difficult for us but it's a bit on besides no I, I think that's exactly the question I mean one question uh, I think we will have I, my my own personal idea is that we may uh, have to be very focused when we move online to to think about what we can do well um, uh, as well as what we do in the physical realm. And uh, one of the attractive ideas is we do a little bit here and we do a little bit here online and we put something here. And, and um, I worry that we could be less, you know, the, the physical library, the expression more than the sum of its parts. I don't know if that sort of translates, you know, sort of the library is more than the books and the librarians and the building. It's something richer. And online, I worry that we're less, we're sort of fractured. And, uh, and that requires intention on, on the part of libraries and librarians. Thank you very much. That, that, I think that this really leads us on to the next question that we've received in from uh, Nilay Sever, um, who should be able to speak in a second. I would just encourage everyone else who hasn't started to look at the Q&A, please do vote for the questions that you think are most interesting. If they haven't been answered yet, add them in yourself. So Nilay, over to you. Um, hello, thank you for the presentations. Uh, actually, uh, Luke answered my question, but I can ask Catherine about it. Um, can you hear me? Yes, very good. Okay, all right, perfect, thank you. Uh, I was curious about the, the future of, of physical importance of libraries, actually. Uh, and uh, my, my concern behind it is about the, the um, librarian's employment, actually. That's all. I hope it's clear. Um, I don't know. Um, no, I don't. I don't. I didn't get it. Sorry, because uh, the the visitors uh, numbers of visitors are rising. But but you ask about the profession or? Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, maybe I should repeat it. I was my question was, do you think the recent technologies uh, or improvements in the changing environment will cause the libraries to uh, lose their physical importance, you know? Like, will they be able to survive? Or will uh, librarians lose their jobs or not? And stuff like that. 
I, I think the physical space will get more and more important because, um, as I said, the numbers of visitors are rising and and we need more and more space. That's what I tried to say to you. The, the Munich Public Library is, is um, opening new branches every year nearly. So uh, I don't see, no. I, I'm not afraid the physical space or physical library is, is dying or does not need it anymore. So we we do uh, our no I don't think so sorry. No, that's great to have such an uh, that's kind of an optimistic outlook. But I guess that's a question that you know that have has been a question even before COVID, kind of with all the digital uh, uh, services that libraries provide. And after COVID, it's it's just been more and more pressing and. As, I can as, only talk about the German situation, so I don't know if in other countries it's a different experience, but we experience the rising number. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Stefan already mentioned you can vote on the questions. And so the uh, question that is the most popular one <laughs> at the moment has been asked by Anna Maria Balester Bon. And Anna Maria, would you like to ask it yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, Thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, I think they were really fascinating, so thank you. Um, my question is about um, community involvement, about you both said it's important, and I think it's very important to get the community involved online, to, to have uh, even user-generated content to get them to, to discuss, to, to be active. And I found that's often not so easy because with the library as a public service, often there's an attitude of, um, okay, the, the, the library has to offer me a service and I'm a passive consumer of that service, be it online books, be it news on Facebook, but I don't see why I should get active and get involved. So what tips do you have to overcome that sort of attitude? Or maybe you haven't found that at all, but here in Spain, um, I find that's, that's often the case. It's a, it's a, it's difficult. It's a, it's a long way to get users to, to get patrons to interaction. We started with some flip charts, some posts. It's the first thing. The, the most important thing they wanted to be seen. So see them, and then they will participate. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I'd be curious. It seems like people can answer. Um, I'd be curious what others who are on this call think, and maybe um, you have answers to Anna Maria. I will say we did a um, actually as a sort of advocacy effort to support funding of the library, uh, invited our patrons to sort of talk about why the library was important to them. And that actual effort was a sort of uh, a small way of making visible um, uh, some of the, you know, what's often hidden. But uh, we have a long way to go to achieve uh, this very good goal. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, one, I think uh, people must learn to participate. It's not from, from one to 100. It, uh, they have to learn it. Thank you. So what we'll now do is following the, the rules of the voting, we now have a joint top question. And the next question will come from uh, Ayla, Ayla Trovac. Ayla, can you speak? Yes, hi to everyone. Uh, I have a question about the digital libraries in terms of older users. We have many problems with that. So in my country, many older users are not IT or information literate, and it is really problematic with these digital services because they don't really understand what we are giving them right now. And so I wanted to ask you how to bridge that generation gap and respond to their user requirements in the best way. Uh, my colleagues answer to this question, so I'm really thankful to them. I can see their answers in the comment section. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I'll, I'll, let me, um, so one thing we do is uh, uh, technology training in our branches, right? Creating a safe space for people to improve their skills. And that will, I think, be um, work for as long as we wanna do it in libraries for many, many years as technology changes and, and different people are left behind in different demographics. Um, a second, you know, we are, 
conscious that when we closed our um, children's books were often browsed and not searched online. And that teaching people to um, select children's books uh, uh, for sort of what we call grab and go, sort of, you know, to pick up, uh, would be teaching everybody a new habit. And like other libraries, we wanted to recommend people use the website, but also push people to a phone number so that they could call and talk to a librarian. So again, this is sort of an example of you have to build parallel systems, knowing that uh, for many people, the digital tools are, um, are, are sort of not a real option for them. So, so in some ways, the answer is, is you have to do two things at once, uh, as opposed to being able to just shift over to, to, to using online technology. Thank you so much. Catherine, would you like to add anything on that or shall we? Yeah, it's, it's really similar in Munich, but it's, it's, uh, I have to say the same. It's a, it's a hard and long way to, 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 to make people know what we're doing digital. They, some people even don't know there is a digital part of the library. So it's talking, talking, talking and helping, helping, helping them to, to get used to it. So similar to Luke. All right, so the next question that just uh, is, is on the top of our list is from uh, Simpi Sharma. Uh, Simpi, I'm just turning on your microphone. Would you like to ask your question yourself? Simpi? Hello, everyone. Yes. Hi, hi, we can hear you. Uh, uh, my question for both speakers, how have your digital library service addresses the social emotional well-being of the readers particularly social uh, school going children to, uh, during the pandemic time thank you thank you simpi um yeah i think a very um a very timely question right shall we stay start with catherine this time so so just made to rephrase it i'm not sure if uh, we all get it got it uh, so so how have your digital library services address the social, social emotional well-being of your readers and especially for children? Mm. The digital holdings. Sorry, Gota, I, I didn't get it yet. Can you the di Yeah, yeah, sure. The digital well-being. So um, when we talk about mental health, when we talk mm. about emotional health, where you did you manage? Because, you know, usually in normal times, we would invite just the kids over and have a kind of a reading. They would play. They would, you know, manage to connect to peers that they otherwise maybe would not meet. Did you manage to have some kind of a digital format for that? Um, no, we tried to. We we tried different ways, but but we haven't the answer yet. It's, we tried some landing pages, some some digital readings. If that was any question at, but for mental health, it is really difficult because I think that's what I tried to say in sense and sensibility. The these physical is really important for mental health. It's. I don't know how to transfer it in the virtual world. And mm. We are still trying to find the right answer to that question. It's, sorry for always the same, but we are in such a change in process. So trying, trying, trying. Yeah, I guess that's, 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 that's how we all, all feel. I, um, and by the way, I mean, most of you have already noticed you can also answer the question yourself. So if you have any idea, it would be really great if you could also comment on Simpi's question. But now over to Luke. Yeah, it's a great question. We don't have an answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if there is an answer. Um, but it's an illustration that we may not be able to do everything online that we were able to do physically. I mean, that's sort of the point about, you know, you know, no one knows you're a dog. You know, you're not, we're not guaranteed that because we, just because we want to do a thing does not mean we will be able to do a thing. And that is a very difficult thing to wrestle with because um, I think we all feel the pain of our patrons and all want to help them. Um, and uh, this will be one of many places that we are, we will feel we're falling short and, and we'll have to wrestle with what that means. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, no, I, I think thank you. I think that, that's, this is the point partly of these sorts of events where we can actually start to share what we're beginning to learn. 
The next question we have is from uh, Rita Lakeso. It, it's There's a couple of questions in there and some of them are quite hard. So I'm gonna hand over to Rita to ask directly. Rita? Hello. Um, yes, I have a couple of questions, but um, I will try to sum it up. So the first one is, how do you feel, how much bigger was the involvement with the, your digital platforms uh, for both speakers? Um, and the other one is, um, how will this digital technology and all the advancement uh, change our librarianship? So for example, here in Portugal, um, there is still a big gap in digital literacy among librarians, even among librarians. And uh, it's really hard to create digital content or uh, to use digital platforms uh, with this. So how will this change our profession, our jobs as librarians? Thank you. Um, so for the first question, um, we, we um, saw a big rise in, in usage of, of digital holdings, but we, as we reopened, it began to decline <laughs> immediately. And the second one, I don't know what it means for librarians, for librarianship, really, but what we faced during lockdown and afterwards was um, actually a, 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 um, a lack of digital literacy in our own role. So what the, we are trying to do is now um, keep the employees involved and this uh, that's what I'm trying to do give them an Instagram channel do, make Facebook do some e-tutorials so learning by doing learning by doing never stop this learning thank you Luke did you have anything to add uh, no that's that's great I mean I I echo Katrin All right, and then uh, we've got a, another very interesting question in the chat by uh, Argula Rublak. Argula, I'm going to turn on your uh, microphone if you'd maybe like to ask the question yourself. Uh, yes, hello. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, thank you. My, my question is about um, open source um, software in libraries. Um, I think a lot of the times we link into commercial platforms as libraries like social media platforms that are not designed for what libraries need and what our users need. And I wondered if it would be, um, if we would, if we should um, invest and commit more to those open source platforms or if that risks alienating the public who are generally on those commercial platforms and if we are just doing, if that shift might basically cause us to lose the audience that we're seeking so I hope that makes sense um, but yeah thanks for the talks they're really fascinating. Thank you Argola I, I feel like Luke might have a strong opinion on that. <laughs> yeah so this is um, I just put something also in the chat which is a sort of link this goes back to sort of the build by join uh, obviously uh, we, we are not technology companies, right? You know, we are not te developers. Um, we may have development capacity, but we cannot build our way out of all of these problems. So we will have to um, assess all the things we want to do and then uh, choose carefully. But I entirely agree with the sort of the, the question, which is um, uh, with a sort of, I think the assumption in the question, which is that for some of these things, we're going to have to build them ourselves. Um, my boss, uh, Tony Aggie, who's our chief digital officer, often says, if the libraries, you know, we don't build our own buildings, but if we couldn't get roof tiles, you know, roofing, if the, you know, uh, if all the roof tiles we could buy had holes in them, we would, we would make our own roof tiles because we can't have water dripping into the house, uh, into the library. You know, it would sort of ruin the book. So the, so the question is, you know, what must we build? You know, one thing we've built or in our building in an open source manner is a project called Library Simplified or Simply E, which is an effort to create a unified front end e reader uh, that patrons can have on their phone uh, that integrates different vendor opportunities, uh, uh, collections in a way that the librarians can control. So we buy ebooks from Overdrive uh, predominantly and also Biblioteca. Uh, but many of our patrons read them on our ebook provider um, so that we're able to make uh, 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 librarian decisions around 
um, basically the single biggest branch around our libraries. So, um, I, you know, this is this I think is the sort of challenge for us. We have many ambitions, but limited resources, and we will need to figure out as a as a community of librarians and, and libraries about where we want to make our most um, important bets. So we're probably not going to build another social media platform, right? We're going to probably you know we will use Instagram or or Facebook or Twitter um, as ways of bringing people into our into our services. But we might want a librarian controlled Zoom, right? Or a librarian controlled Google Meet, right? We might want a way of doing public programming with, um, without our patrons being subject to facial recognition and data tracking. I mean, you know, you know those are the sort of decisions we'll have to, we'll have to make. Yeah, that's, I think, a very, very interesting aspect. We've been asking ourselves actually the same questions while thinking about this series of seminars, and then we went for Zoom because, you know, <laughs> for obvious reasons, right? Katrin, do you, in Munich, do you work with open source platforms, or are you rather going, trying to get there where the users are? Uh, Steve Munich is working with, with open source. We had Linux last for the last 10 years, I think, but now switching to Windows, back to Windows, because Linux, sorry, <laughs> doesn't fulfill the expectations. We are trying to, but if you, if you start thinking about this, there are so many questions. I, I love the, the hotspots of NYPL and, and thinking about do libraries need to uh, own cloud? Perhaps it's a big question. I just, same as I say everything, I, every time I don't have the answer yet, but that's what we're thinking about. But for me, the most important thing is, is to try to, to build own platforms. Yeah, not everything is, can be built on own platforms, but you should, uh, when it's possible, you should. And we do not invest in social media on Facebook. We just use it, but I don't want to invest on it. Yeah, on the social media, I made this point. Um, I think there's a difference between um, advertising on the platform and putting your service on the platform. So, you know, going onto Facebook and saying, um, come to the library to, you know, to, to, to do a program or come to the library's website or here's a te teaser or whatever um, is different than using Facebook Live as the way of delivering the library platform because in truth, it means that you are conditioning people to go to Facebook to view the library. And in some very real way, Facebook is becoming the library. And, um, you know, there will be moments when we will put it entirely on Facebook, but we'll also put it on our website. So as to, so as to sort of mitigate some of the, the, the choices. But I think that's, you know, that is, um, and there are people within my organization who would sort of say that's a, who disagree, who totally disagree. They say, the library is the program. Wherever the program grows, the library lives. So, you know, even within the New York Public Library, there are di differing op opinions. I I'm offering sort of mine and, and what some of my colleagues believe. So, um, so I, I wanna say that so that, you know, even within New York, there's sort of uncertainty about this, but that's the question we face now. What are these, you know, is an ebook reader more like a book or more like the library? And where you come down on that will, will help you decide whether you think you need to build something or you're happy to to continue using that platform and there's no one right answer thank you very much and that, that's a i was about to say that I'm, I'm going to give both uh luke and Catherine a couple of minutes to think of really good final words i realize that you've both given some very good words right now i will nonetheless give you 30 seconds or so to think and what we'll do in the meanwhile is we're going to run the poll again and so we're going to see have the examples changed? So I'm just relaunching the poll onto the screen and we'll try and go for about 30 seconds on this. And let's see, do you think the libraries can create as strong a link with their communities in a virtual as in a physical world? Okay, over 50 votes so far, going up quickly. Okay, let's give it another five seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. And we'll see if we get over 100 votes. One more person needs to vote, then we're at 100. 
Oh, I'll go in your, there we go, perfect. So, and now the results on the screen. Oh, we, we, we've got a little bit more pessimistic. That's interesting. So I, I don't know if this, this, so we're still up people, I don't know that the highest score is for seven this time rather than for eight. Um, people are still relatively positive, but maybe a little bit less than they were when starting out, which is part of the goal of this to make us think again. So what I'll do now is just hand over the floor to uh, Luke and then Catherine in order to say any final words. Um, thank you uh, uh, to IFLA and Goethe Institute, uh, Stephen and uh, everyone for, for organizing this. Uh, the dominant, you know, the phrase that uh, technology companies talk about is sort of move fast and break things, right? That's the sort of Facebook line. And that is a um, paradigm that comes from the funding model under them, right? The sort of, they can raise lots of capital and if they, if they sort of build quickly, they, um, they can make a lot of money. But that's not inherent to technology. And I would say for public libraries, we should think about um, moving slow and mending things. So, you know, we are all intending to be here as institutions in, in another 50 years, in another 100 years, right? We're not um, going, we can't afford to go out of business. Um, and uh, nor are we in the business of breaking things. Uh, we're in the business of fixing things, fixing things in our communities and the lives of our, our patrons. And, uh, and I would use this to draw a contrast between what the technology and some of the companies behind the technology, their interests and incentives are and what our own are. And I think one of the most powerful things about the libraries are our values and what we stand for. And I think we should be um, true to those as we make our technology decisions and, and, um, and, and we sort of reject for ourselves, move fast and break things. And, um, and I think if we do it together, uh, uh, we can be incredibly powerful. Thank you. And over to Catherine. I'll make it short. I'm just happy that we started the discussion and are already in the middle of it. And so let's get on with it. Thanks. Thank you. So very briefly, on behalf of Gerald, who's had to leave, I wanted to, to thank uh, Luke and Catherine for all of your words. Thanks to everyone for all of the questions, all of the suggestions, the comments and the ideas that you've shown. What we'll be doing is copying down the questions and then sharing them. So if there are any further comments people want to make with a little bit more time, um, that, that will be possible. And then we'll, we'll get them up on the website, on the Goethe Institute website. And to both our panelists and to our emerging international voices, we look forward to seeing you shortly for our masterclass. And yep, great. Thank you very much. And thank you, much to, thank you very much to everyone. And don't forget to join us next week for the final webinar. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>